Let's start off with our first technical presentation. It's from the MathWorks. It's by uh, Dr. Ethem, Dr. Okay. Dr. Ethem Sozer from the MathWorks, and it's about a really exciting topic called mod modulation classification. And in particular, we're going to be looking at um, through Ethem's presentation about using deep learning for modulation classification. So with that, let's warmly welcome Ethem to new SCR 2019. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. So deep learning, uh, there's been lots of interest in deep learning in recent years. Uh, it started mostly with uh, image processing. So now we can have computers that can identify dogs and cats in pictures. So you can say, why? But it leads to really nice applications. Like now we have cars with video cameras on them and they can process the streaming images from those video cameras, figure out where the roads are, you know, if there are other cars or pedestrians on the road, and drive by themselves. And we also have now applications uh, in signal processing, uh, for example, audio applications, where we can talk to our phone and say, hey, Siri, where's the nearest coffee shop? And it will recognize your voice, process it, figure out that you're asking about coffee houses and show you a map with the coffee houses on it. And more recently, uh, we also start seeing wireless communications applications uh, that use deep learning. And we have, see, we have been seeing lots of lots of papers on this topic too. So my name is Etam Sözer. I work for MathWorks on communications toolbox. And I'm going to talk about how you can use MathWorks tools, a spatial communications toolbox, to do some deep learning uh, applications for wireless communications. And I'm going to use modulation classification as an example. So a little bit of agenda. We are going to start with uh, the problem definition and deep learning workflows. We are going to talk about how you can use communication toolbox for these uh, deep learning workflows. We're going to jump into the modulation classification example, and then we are going to look at some extra resources. So what is modulation classification? Uh, anybody? Any idea? <laughs> All right. So it's basically to blindly identify the modulation scheme of a received signal. So we have a receiver. We don't know. Maybe we don't know who that receiver is. We, we don't know what kind of modulation type it's using. And we have a transmitter who wants to figure out what kind of modulation type that receiver is using. So it does some deep learning magic and says, OK, I am 93% confident that that modulation type is QPSK. And maybe with 7% chance, it's PPSK. So that's what uh, modulation classification is. So why do we need modulation classification? Uh, one obvious application is cognitive radio. In cognitive radio, we want to know what's happening in the RF spectrum around us. We want to know what kind of modulation types, what kind of users are there. And the other application is spectrum surveillance and management. You know, maybe the spectrum is uh, specifically to use by some modulation types and not the other ones. So if you find a QPS case, uh, transmitter in this spectrum, we may want to say, you're not supposed to be there, stop transmitting. Or if there's an OFTM receiver over there, we may be able to say, oh, you're OK. That's the spectrum that you need to be. So keep going. Uh, another application is signals intelligence. So in this case, we really want to know what's happening around us. We may want to know what kind of modulation types are used. We may even want to know what kind of information is carried in that modulated signal. So we also have some challenges. You know, uh, if everything was ideal, we wouldn't need any kind of intelligent system to tell us what kind of modulation type is out there. But in the real world, things are not ideal. So let's switch to Simulink. So I created a small model to just show what happens. Uh, in this case, I'm going to start with no impairments at all. So 
if I run this model, so it's going to just start uh, producing some modulated signals. Uh, you probably can't see the transmitter symbols because they are hidden, hiding behind those ideal uh, constellation points. Because this is nothing, just transmitted perfect signals. And if you look at that, you can say, I know what it is, that's 16 QAM. You know? But let's try to make that worse. Let's see. I think that's the most I can. Uh, let's start by adding some noise. Okay. All right. So we can add noise, which happens in the real world. And if you are using real radios, you will probably see some IQ imbalance. So let's add some IQ imbalance. Now that looks like this. Let's add some phase imbalance. Now we are making our constellation worse and worse. Let's add some frequency offset. All right, now it starts rotating. And let's add some multipad fading channel. Okay, who can say that that's a 16 QAM modulated signal? <laughs> so we want a system to be able to identify this as 16 QAM. All right. And hint, we are going to use this model later. So deep learning workflows. So when you're designing it, deep learning network, uh, you follow this path. You start with data. That data may be in files on your hard disk, in a database, maybe somewhere on the cloud, or it may be coming from sensors. Maybe saved, maybe it's coming live, streaming. After you get your data, you pre-process that data and try to extract some features. Uh, when you pre-process, you may be denoising and smoothing the data, you may be doing some data reduction and transforming your data into some other uh, format that may be more helpful for you. And you may be accepting some features if you know that some features will be helpful uh, for your deep learning algorithm. You may do that too. And once you are done you know, doing all these things to your data, now you are ready to design your network. So you design your network, you create a model, it has parameters, you test your network with several parameters, you do lots of iterations, you validate it, and finally you say, okay, the performance is good enough for me, my network is ready for deployment, and next step is to deploy that network. And there are different ways of doing that, you can create a desktop app, you can generate code and embed into your system, and you are done. So how does wireless communications fit into this workflow? Now, we have an advantage. Uh, we don't need to go out and collect data because wireless signals are man-made signals. They are synthetic signals, so we can simulate those. And for validation, we can use software-defined radio. We can generate these signals, send through one radio, uh, let it go through a, known, you know, uh, a channel, a real channel, receive it the other radio, and then really test and validate our model. So how does communications toolbox help? So we, you know, in image processing, the signals are natural signals, right? We need to go and take pictures, thousands of pictures. As I already mentioned, calm signals are man-made. So we have standards, it's already defined, so we can simulate those signals, with the, for example, with the model that I just showed you. And by doing this, we don't have to go out and collect data and save all that, thing, uh, all that data in the uh, hard disk. Instead, we can just simulate in MATLAB or in your desktop and uh, accelerate your development time. So what about testing with SDR? MATLAB uh, and Simulink 
as connectivity to SDR devices, uh, starting from the very simple one. We have RTL SDR, it's a receive only radio. Uh, it's just $20, and for that much of money, you get a lot of functionality out of that. Uh, one step up is the Pulda SDR. Uh, for about $99, you get a TX and RX radio. It can uh, transmit uh, signals from 50 megahertz to 6 gigahertz. It can sample up to like 50, 60 mega samples per second. So a very capable small radio. One step up is the USRP radios, you know, X radio, B radio, and 210. And we call these radios uh, I.O. radios. So they are basically for input and output. So what they do is uh, you either receive signals, uh, RF signals, using the radio and pass them to MALAP uh, for processing, or you can generate signals in MALAP and pass them to the radio to be sent out as RF signals. Now, if you want to target, then you need to go one step up and use the zinc based radios or the USRP E310. In this case, we, these radios have a zinc processor, so you can target the FPGA and the ARM processor on that and create uh, standalone radios. All right, it's time for our demo. This demo is already published, so it's available on the internet. Okay. So, for this uh, modulation classification example, I used uh, 11 modulation types, eight digital, three analog. Why did I use this? Because I started looking for papers. I found a paper from Timo Shea, and he was using these modulation types. Uh, but also there was a recent DARPA challenge for modulation classification. And these uh, modulation types were also used in that challenge, plus more. So what we want to do is, so we want to create some modulated frames. We will call them unknown frames, but because we are not going to tell the receiver what type of modulation we use. And then we are going to tell our neural network to classify these unknown frames. And it will tell us, OK, you gave me seven frames, and I think they are BPSK. And maybe it will tell us how confident it is. These are the scores. Scores are basically probabilities. And in this case, the network is saying that it's pretty sure these are BPSK channels. Now we can uh, repeat the same thing with PAM4. And in this case, it again said, yep, you gave me seven PAM4 frames. And in this case, with the first one, it was like 75% sure it was PAM4. And for the rest, it's still pretty sure. So this is what we want to do. How are we going to do that? OK. Uh, first of all, we talked about you know, we need to create uh, training frames. We need to give examples of these impaired modulated frames to the network so that it can identify those and it can learn how to identify those. And the first step of doing that is uh, simulate a channel. And in this case, we use AWGN in the channel. We also use rice in multipath fading. And we added some clock offset because no radio is perfect and there's always some clock offset. And that clock offset results in a center frequency offset and sampling time drift. And we are going to simulate those two. For simulating AWGN, we have a com.awgn system object. Uh, has anybody heard about system objects in MAL? All right, a couple hands. So a system object is basically, we can say, it's a glorified function. Uh, system objects are great if you want to keep track of state in your system. Uh, if, has anybody used the uh, FIR filter function, filter function in MALA? Right. Have you tried to keep track of the state with that function? If you did, you would know how painful it is. And with these system objects, you don't have to go through that pain. And for the rising channel, we have com.rising channel system object. You can adjust all its parameters. 
And then for clock offset, which is uh, results in frequency offset, we use com dot phase frequency offset system object. And for simulating the sampling rate offset, we use the interp one function uh, to resample the signal. And again, another advantage of system objects is you can actually put these system objects together and create a system out of them. And this is what I did here. So I created a test channel system using those system. I put all those system objects into one place, and now I can just call my channel, and it will just apply all those channel impairments to my signal. All right, now we are ready to generate all those training signals. So we are going to do this for all modulation types, 11 of them. And we are going to create 10,000 frames for each modulation type. And the first thing I'm going to do is generate some data. In case of digital modulation, this is just random ones and zeros, binary data. And for analog modulation types, I'm going to use a voice uh, audio file. And then I'm going to modulate that using modulation functions like PSK mode and QAM mode in Malab. I'm going to pass that through my channel. Now I have these impaired modulated frames. And I want to uh, pre-process them, basically crop them into uh, known sample sizes. Like I want to have uh, 1,024 samples for each frame. And I want to make sure that I don't have any transients at the beginning of the packet. I want to remove those transients. And I also want to make sure that my frames start at a random point in the symbol. The symbols are eight times oversampled. And I don't want my frames to start at the first sample of the first symbol all the time. Because in real world, when I'm capturing these signals, I don't know where I'm starting my frame. And I don't want to fool my network and say, it always starts from the first sample. So if it doesn't, then it will get confused. So I need that random randomness. And then I'm going to store those frames in something that we call a frame store. It's basically a place where we store these frames in the memory and we can access them uh, whenever we want. So when I run this, I generate all these frames. And then now. Uh, I need to split my data into three pieces. So why do I need to split my data? I need test data, validation data. Uh, I need training, test, training, validation, and test data. Uh, in deep learning networks, when you train the network, you first use your training frames to train the network. And then you use your validation frames to figure out how well you did. Because you want to know, you know, Am I doing well? Like, am I converging? Is this training algorithm converging? If it's not, you need to change your uh, model, or you may need to change your training symbols. So you iterate through this training and validation loop until you reach to a validation number that you are satisfied with. Now, are you done? No. Now, you want to test this network with your test frames. Why the test frames? Because we want to test with something that the network has never seen before. So that's why we are dividing our frames into training, validation, and test. We are going to use 80% of the frames for training, 10 for validation, and 10 for uh, test. And these are some sample frames for different modulation types. And this is how they look in uh, frequency domain. And now we are ready to design our network. And we start with an image input layer. So why are we using an image input layer? Uh, as we talked, deep learning algorithms, the deep, deep learning research started with image processing and video processing. So most of the deep learning algorithms you will find out the wild, they use images as inputs. And they use, they may also use audio files as inputs, but in, in any case, they're all real signals. And in wireless comms, what kind of signals do we have? Real signals? No, complex signals. So how are you going to use a complex signal with this network then? And we are forced to use an image input layer. So what we are going to do is we are going to say, OK, I have a complex signal. It has a real part and an imaginary part. So I'm going to put the real part as my first row 
and the imaginary part as the second row of an image. And I'm going to create a two by 1024 image for myself. And then I will input that to my system. And then I'm going to use a convolution layer followed by a batch normalization layer, RELU layer, and a max pooling layer. And I'm going to repeat this seven times. And in the convolution layer, I'm going to use a filter of one by eight. You know, eight being the oversampling rate. After the convolution layers, I'm going to have a fully connected layer and a softmax layer, and finally, I'll have a classification layer which is gonna tell me with what probability this network thinks that modulation type is. So that network looks like this. So I'm done with defining my network. Now I need to decide on my training options. So what I do is, in this case, I use an SGDM solver. I will use a GPU to train, because if you train this network on a CPU, it may take like 10 to 12 hours. But with a GPU, it takes just 25 minutes. So if you are doing deep learning, you really need a GPU. OK, and then we set up all these parameters. If you want to learn more about these, you can just go to MALAP documentation, and they are there. And now we are ready to say, OK, train my network using my training signals and training labels. These labels are basically what kind of modulation type that frame is, like it's a PPSK, QPSK. And use this network structure, use these options, and wait for 25 minutes, and you get this. So basically, this shows the accuracy of your model. And with this one, we got about 90% accuracy for this channel with 11 modulation types. And this is the confusion matrix that basically says, if I have sent this, what did the network think I got? So we can see that there's some confusion for QAM modulation types, 16 QAM and 64 QAM. The network wasn't quite sure. That's kind of expected because 16 QAM is a subset of 64 QAM with this kind of channel. And there may be some confusion. And there was some confusion between QPSK and 8PSK. And if you think about it, if there is some frequency offset, if your constellation is rotating, a QPSK looks like an 8PSK. So can we do better? Uh, one of the things that we did here, like we put the I and Q on the rows as an image, and then we defined a convolutional filter of size 1 by 8. What that does it, it just convolves the I by itself and Q by itself. So we are not taking advantage of the phase data in the convolution layers. So how can we do, get information from the phase? What we did is instead of putting the I and Q on the first dimension, we put it on the third dimension. So sort of we created an image of one by 1024 with two colors in it, like like red, red and blue in you know, colored images. When you do that, the network actually starts convol uh, running a convolutional filter uh, over the pages. And after waiting another 25 minutes, we get 95% of accuracy. And this time, the confusion matrix like, looks like this. So it's a little bit doing better than the last one. Uh, QAMs are less confused, QPSK and HPSK is less confused. So I'm happy with that model, but does it really going to work, right? If I put this on the wild, if I use radios, a real channel, is it gonna work? Is my model good enough? So let's test that. So we create a little app for this. I'm using two Adam Pluto radios, one for transmitting, one for receiving. And there's a really nice feature in uh, MALAP for uh, Pluto radios called transmit repeat. What you can do is you can create a signal uh, in MALAP and send it, basically download it to the uh, radio and say, 
Dear radio, please transmit this and keep repeating. What that does is it offloads the transmitter processing from your MATLAB routine to the radio. Now you can focus on the receiver side. So that's what we are going to use. We are going to send like 100 frames per modulation type and see what happens. So now it's starting the transmitter. And now it's adjusting the power level uh, or gain level on the receiver side so that we don't you know, overload the A to Ds or we don't get just almost zero signals. And now, so our transmitted waveform is BPSK, and our network thinks it's receiving BPSK. And it's pretty confident. It says, like, I'm almost 100% sure those signals are BPSK. And then after it's done with BPSK, it's going to create a QPSK signal, send it through the tr uh, transmitter, receive on the uh, receiver uh, and do the same thing. And in this case, you can see that in some cases, it's pretty sure in some cases, it may be 8PSK, in some cases it thinks it's really 8PSK. So that's what we also expected when we simulated this. So it, this gives us high confidence that those simulated models, those things that we did in MALAP only, they also work in the real, real world. So let's go back to our slides. OK. So how can MALAP help us with this deep learning for wireless communications. Communications Toolbox has many features like modulators, general models, RF impairments. Here I am showing the Simulink uh, library for Communications Toolbox, but all those things are also available in MATLAB. You can generate standard specific signals. Mike has already talked about this. You know, 5G, LTE, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, NFC. You can do all of those. And what other applications are there for machine learning and deep learning uh, for wireless comms? So we talked about signal classification. Another application area is device identification, otherwise known as RF fingerprinting. So in this case, we don't want to know what kind of modulation type we are interested in. Who is transmitting? What radio is transmitting these things? It's sort of like that uh, Bluetooth track. Uh, we can model PAs, and we can design digital predistorters. We can design receivers. Uh, we can design uh, synchronization uh, systems. We can design decoders, demodulators. We can model channels. And this is a really interesting one. Uh, basically, there's something called an autoencoder. For a given channel, you tell the deep learning network, Dear network, please design me both the transmitter and the receiver. That's going to give me the best possible system for this given channel. It's a really interesting research area. And I think DeepSig has uh, some model, that, a satellite system that's designed using these autoencoders. And the last but not least, you can also do some optimizations for your wireless network. So you go beyond the physical layer and start working with these you know, second and third layers. Uh, we have seen this slide before. So this is the deep learning workflow. So how does MathWorks help you with this? We have many, many toolboxes for this. So if you have WLAN, LTE, 5G toolboxes, you can generate those standard signals, communications toolbox, and phase array system toolbox. With these, you can generate those signals in MALAP and train, uh, get your training. Uh, you can use the wavelets and signal processing toolbox to pre-process those signals. Deep learning toolbox, that's machine learning toolbox to design and uh, validate those uh, networks. And you can use MALAP coder to deploy these networks on uh, real systems. So MathWorks also provides apps to help you uh, really uh, work on your systems in a 
efficient way. So how do you access those apps? Let's go back to Malab. If you go to the Apps tab, and here are those apps, like machine learning apps, for example, signal processing and communication apps. Uh, so one of the more popular ones is like uh, this classification learner. Uh, it really helps you get a good insight of your data and compare different algorithms uh, for performance. Uh, the next one is this deep network designer, and I really want to spend some time on this. So let's go to the apps. Uh, where is it? Deep network designer, here it is. So when I first started working on this project, uh, I was new to deep learning. I did you know, wireless communications and SDR before, but I didn't do deep learning. So I found this paper. It's describing a deep learning network. But I don't know how I'm going to implement that network in Malab. And then I found this deep network designer app. With this one, you basically just drag and drop. You say, OK, I have an input layer. We already talked about what we are using the image input layer. Oh, sorry. All right, so this is the deep network designer. So we have the image input layer. Let's say that's followed by a convolution layer. You just put it there, connect it. You click on that. All the properties are here. You play with those. And then let's say it's followed by an RELU layer. You put that in. I'm just making this up, but you know, if you have a paper and you, if you want to recreate it, it's just drag and drop. And then let's say we have a soft, or no. Let's put a fully connected layer here. And for example, in our case, we had you know, 11 outputs. Then a softmax layer. Let's connect that. Followed by a classification layer. All right, now I have my network. I can say analyze this. It will look at it and say, okay, I don't have any warnings or errors. It may work. <laughs> and then I can export this and generate the malap code. And here is it. OK, this is my network. Now I can play around with this. All right, we have seen this. We have single processing and communication applications, also apps. And this one is also a very nice one. Uh, let's go to that using Malap. Apps and wireless waveform generator. Mike also talked about this. With this one, you can generate different modulated signals. You can add channel impairments on that. And the nice thing about it, everything is parameterized. You don't need to remember to write any code. You just fill in the blanks here. You can generate you know, standard specific signals. You can add impairments, you know, AWGN, DC offset, nonlinearities, and you can say, okay, generate. And it will generate the signal for you. And then you can export that signal to a file or a workspace. Or if you have some instruments, you can send them to the instruments. I don't have those. Right. And that's my presentation. Any questions or comments?
I'm kind of more concerned about how long it takes to train your network. Like, a uh, second thing is, uh, you know, a uh, little bit uh, some information about uh, uh, how to include rich uh, waveforms. Like, you know, uh, for example, I, I would like to basically classify some modulations coming from, you know, one type of waveform uh, versus some other modulation coming from a different type of waveform. Basically, I kind of captured, let us say, some some RF data. I don't know whether that you know that RF data has, let us say, an LTE signal or a CDMA signal, but both of them actually have QPSK modulation. So how do I basically include some of these variations in your in your setup? Uh, in this specific case, with the GPU, it took about 25 minutes to train it, but you know it depends. That number depends heavily on you know how deep your network is how many frames you use to train the network. So it, it all depends. But in this specific case, with the GPU, 25 minutes. Yeah. You know, if you have a GPU network, you, you can use multiple GPUs. That's also supported. Uh, so you can reduce your training time even more. Uh, for classifying other types of signals, you know, as long as you can train your signal, let's train your network, with those signals, you can say that, you know, you can capture those signals, you don't have to simulate them. Let's say you captured those signals, put, on the, put them into files, you, you, you labeled them, you said this is CDMA, you know, this is uh, LTE, this is WLAN, whatever. As long as you use those training frames, uh, the network should be able to figure out how to distinguish those things. Any other? Oh. Is it possible to, once you've trained this network, can you export it to some fashion where it can be run without MATLAB? Like say I want to run this on an embedded device and travel around and do live classification? Sure, yes. Uh, you can use MATLAB coder to generate C code. You, uh, MATLAB supports TensorRT, so you can generate TensorRT files and you can put the network to anything that supports TensorRT file type. Thank you. then you have the GPU coder that, that can generate automatic CUDA code for you. Uh, with that, Atham, I have a question. How did you choose your uh, accuracy? You said that you worked towards a 90% accuracy. Was it just a random number? You wanted at least 90 or? Uh, it was just a high enough number for me. <laughs> do, do you think if you had more training samples and you set it to, I mean, did you reach like a saturation level at 90 that even if you tried harder, you couldn't go beyond that, or? Uh, in this case, uh, actually beyond 90, even if I trained it, you know, twice or three times more, I didn't get too much improvement from that. So that was kind of the saturation point. So that's why I stopped at, you know, 90. Any other questions? Yep. Uh, thanks. I know um, we've talked about this before. Like, you said earlier that you didn't have a background in deep learning, but you have a pretty good background in um, adaptive equalization. Can you maybe give an opinion of uh, why all these deep learning guys have taken these adaptive equalization concepts and claimed it as their own? <laughs> Very good point. <laughs> uh, actually, you know, before I delved into deep learning, uh, it, it, it sounded like this great idea. Right. It's deep learning, come on, you know. <laughs> it must be this powerful, powerful tool, Neve tool, all Neve tool. That, that's what I thought. And then when I started getting into it, I said, you know what? We've been doing this for a long time. Example equalizers, <laughs> right? Uh, yes, that is right. Deep learning has been around for a long time uh, in, in the form of machine learning. And an equalizer is a very good example of machine learning system. Uh, the deep learning uh, also has been known for a long time. You know, if you increase the size of this machine learning algorithm, you know that it may do better. But we didn't have the computing power to do that. But now that we have the computing power, now we can increase the size of these neural networks and let them do like magical stuff, like 
recently, for example, I was in a conference uh, on GANs. GANs are like generative adversarial networks. Uh, they can train these networks uh, with images, and then they can give this network an image from 1880s, like this black and white image, and make that image come to life basically in 3Ds giving a speech. So, so these, these are really powerful tools and we're just starting to figure out like how we can use these in wireless communications. Okay. Oh. So um, how much noise do you need to add before this starts to fail? And does that roughly correspond to the noise level that, say, channel coding will also start to fail? Because that's the kind of levels that you expect noise to be at. Uh, it all depends how you train it. Uh, I don't remember the noise level that I use here, but it wasn't too high. But uh, there are papers which says, like, you, if you train your network with, you know, high SNR uh, signals, and then you start adding more training with lower SNR signals on top of it, you can go to like zero dB, and it can still function pretty well. Okay, so with that, let's uh, thank Atham once again.